Hi, thanks for joining this symposium on spatial reorientation. My name is Alexandre Zval, and I am a postdoc in the philosophy department at the University of British Columbia. My talk is called Place Cells and the Geometric Module. So psychologists have used a specific experimental paradigm to study spatial reorientation over the last 30 years. It's a paradigm that has been used with human subjects as well as many non-human species. And I'll be focusing on non-human animals in my presentation. So in a typical reorientation experiment, an animal explores an environment looking for a particular goal. So usually the animal's hungry and is just looking for food that's hidden under the litter in one of the corners. As soon as the animal finds the goal, it's then removed from the environment and then put in a dark box where it's rotated for a few seconds. Then the animal is brought back to the same enclosure. And what's of interest is where the animal goes looking for the same goal again. You'll notice that in this environment, there are three black stripes on the short wall closest to the, the goal location. So we know we know from other type of navigation experiments that non-human animals are very good at using this kind of information to return to a known goal location. So a very intuitive prediction as to what should happen in these experiments is that the animals should go looking for the food in the correct corner upon returning to the enclosure. But it, it turns out that they only do this on about half of the trials. On the remaining trials, they most often go to the corner diagonal to it. So that's a rather counterintuitive finding, um, and it's led to an important literature, which is what we discuss today. So just a bit of terminology first. Uh, when I talk about geometry or geometric cues, I mean anything that has to do with the 3D layout of the environment. So for example, uh, the height or the length of the walls. When I talk about feature cues, I mean uh, cues that pertain to colors, 2D patterns, or textures on the walls or any surfaces. Um, so the three black stripes that we saw on the previous uh, slide count together as a feature cue. The main goal of this presentation is to defend a specific framework of spatial reorientation, what's called the geometric module framework. I'm going to proceed in three steps. Step one, I'm going to present a well-known objection to the geometric module framework from neurophysiological experiments. Step two, I'll be responding to this objection with a new model from within the framework. And then step three, I'm going to be using that model to sketch a new argument in favor of the geometric module framework or two competing frameworks. So step one. A neuro, an objection from neurophysiological experiments. So let's get clear on what the geometric module framework says first. It says that subjects use a geometric representation to guide their search behavior. So in a way, it's the most natural or intuitive way of understanding what's going on in reorientation experiments. It says that subjects go to the two geometrically adequate corners because all they have to rely on is a geometric representation of the environment. So suppose that the subject has just returned to the environment following the disorientation procedure. In that context, there are two ways in which it could align its geometric representation with the environment. One way in which it's correctly aligned, like this. So when that happens, the subject correctly estimates its location in the environment, as well as the location of the goal and it then goes looking for the goal in the right place. Another way in which it could be aligned is basically a 180 degrees misalignment like this. And when that happens, the subject misestimates its location by 180 degrees, as well as the location of the goal here. So that's the, the explanation of the findings from the perspective of the geometric module framework. Okay, now I wanna talk about a different class of navigation experiments, which rely on single cell recording methods in neuroscience. There are neurophysiological experiments. Perhaps the most famous findings from uh, neurophysiological experiments is the discovery of so-called place cells in the hippocampus. A place cell is a neuron that fires in a specific region of a known environment. 
they also tile the environment. So at every location in a known environment, there's going to be at least one play cell that's active. So that's a common way of representing the activity of a play cell. You'll see that on the left hand side, the gray squiggly lines represent the, the path followed by the subject as it explores the environment. And the black dots represent the activity of the neuron, the spikes of the, of the neuron being recorded. So the spikes are concentrated in a particular area of the environment. And that's called the firing field of the play cell. On the right hand side, you have a representation of this place cells firing as a function of the location uh, of the subject in the environment. So blue represents a very low firing rate, whereas red represents the highest firing rate. So it's basically just a very neat way of seeing that this particular place cell has a firing field in the top right area of the environment. So we're now in a position to focus on a major finding that's crucial for the rest of the discussion. It's that the firing field of a play cell follows feature cues after disorientation in many contexts. So these results are from the NIRM experiments. So basically subjects were exposed to the same enclosure over multiple sessions, uh, which each lasted a few minutes. And they used a cue card in the enclosure. So it's basically a thin sheet of paper that's pasted on the inside wall of the enclosure, and that's a different color from the walls. And so the, the gray lines close to the circles represents the position of the cue card during a session. So what's of interest to us is to notice that the play cell being recorded here follows the cue card as it rotates around the environment. And it's also important to note that there's a disorientation procedure between each of the sessions. So really the play cell is following the cue card, the feature cue, uh, after disorientation in this context. So with this finding, we're in a position to, to state the objection against the geometric module framework that I wanted to discuss. So geometric module theorists seem committed to two ideas. First, that the geometric module is the only system in charge of estimating the subject's location following disorientation. And two, that the geometric module only uses geometry. Actually, the second clause is really essential for the framework. Yet, the finding that we just saw suggests that subjects use feature cues to estimate their location following disorientation, basically because place cells follow feature cues following disorientation. Step two responding to the objection with a new model. So here we have the place cell system. It's not just a neural system, it's a cognitive system in its own right. Its function is to continually keep track of the subject's estimated location in the environment. In normal contexts, it receives idiothetic information as input. So information like optic flow, proprioception, vestibular signal, etc. These systems, they continually provide input to the place cell system to help it keep a dynamic representation of the subject's estimated location in real time and when the environment is too dark. But there are specific contexts where idiothetic information isn't that useful because the subject has lost all perceptual access to its surroundings for a longer period of time. In these contexts, you need to reinitialize the place cell system. So what I want to propose is that there are two resetting mechanisms for the place cell system. They are the geometry-based resetting mechanism and the feature-based resetting mechanism. What they do is that they reinitialize place cell activity following various sorts of disruptions. And my main claim is that once we fill out this kind of model, it's going to turn out that the geometry-based resetting mechanism has the relevant properties to count as the geometric module. All right, let's try to make this a bit more concrete. So suppose that we're in a reorientation experiment. So the animal has just returned to the enclosure following uh, the disorientation procedure here. 
So in that case, the geometric module will produce two potential locations for the subjects based on the geometry. So it will produce a location estimation, which is the correct one, and one which is misaligned by 180 degrees. The feature-based resetting mechanism, on the other hand, will produce various potential location estimations based on the three black stripes on the short wall. So based on those cues here, it's going to produce various potential location estimations here. But an important claim here is that there's something about reorientation experiments that prevents the feature-based resetting mechanism from sending its estimated locations to the play cell system. So in other words, this resetting mechanism is ignored in reorientation experiments. When that happens, basically, the play cell system only receives two potential location estimations from the geometric module, and it has no other information by which to tell which of, which of those two locations is the right one. So it basically has to choose randomly between those two locations. So a prediction of this kind of model is that subjects in reorientation experiments should see their play cells fire in their original firing field on about half of the trials. And in the other half of the trials, the same play cell should fire in a field which is misaligned by 180 degrees, as in this case here. And by the way, that's a prediction that's borne out in a recent paper that I discussed in step three of the presentation. And very quickly, I think that the reason why the feature-based resetting mechanism is ignored in reorientation experiments is that there's a stability precondition on its use. So it provides input only if the relevant feature cue has been assessed as stable. I'm happy to discuss the empirical backing for this claim uh, during the Q&A. Okay, now step three. I'm gonna sketch a new argument for the geometric module framework over the adaptive combination framework and associated framework of spatial reorientation. Uh, just a word of caution, uh, due to time constraints, I really can't do full justice to these two frameworks. Uh, so I'm just gonna try to convey that if we take into account the considerations discussed uh, in the beginning of the discussion, it might show that these frameworks have a problem, uh, but it's gonna be tentative. Um, so you'll remember from the beginning of the presentation that in uh, typical reorientation experiments, subjects go to the correct corner and uh, the, di the corner diagonal to it uh, on, on half of the trials each. So when, when subjects go to the second corner, we call making this a rotational error here. So the question uh, at the heart of the argument that I want to raise is the following which cognitive systems are most directly responsible for rotational errors. So here's a way of visually representing the argument. I'm claiming that the adaptive combination and associative frameworks put the origin of rotational errors in the wrong place. So first, I'm going to argue that the adaptive combination and associative frameworks locate the origin of rotational errors in decision-making systems for spatial navigation. Whereas in fact, they originate from the interactions between the play cell system and its own input systems. And this in turn is gonna turn out to favor the geometric module framework because it can accommodate that fact. After all, the model that I've developed in step two of this presentation predicts that. There are a lot of differences between the adaptive combination and associative frameworks, but the heart of their explanatory strategy is similar. Is that we should explain why subjects choose a specific corner in reorientation experiment in a very direct way. They both provide mathematical equation to calculate the probability that subjects will choose a specific corner given the cues that are present in that corner. So suppose we consider this corner here. It has the right geometric properties. So just like the correct corner, which is here, it has the, uh, a long wall on the left and a short wall on the right. But it has a wrong feature properties. So it's not anywhere close to three black stripes. It only has a white wall here. 
So this kind of information is used to calculate a probability that subjects will choose that corner of, say, 0.43 here. If you consider this corner, on the other hand, it has the wrong geometric properties. So it has a short wall on the left and a long wall on the right. But it has the right feature properties. So it's close to the three black stripes here. So this kind of information is used to calculate a probability that subjects will choose this corner of, say, 0 0.07 here. So on these kinds of model, there's no appeal to a process of estimating the subject's location, which uh, sometimes misfire due to rotational ambiguity. It's all explained directly in terms of a decision-making process. So basically, we want to explain why the animal chooses this path and ends up in that corner here, rather than choosing that path and ending, and ending in that corner there. All right. So now I want to claim that the origin of rotational errors is in fact in the interactions between the place cell system and its input systems, not in decision-making systems. So I think there are two findings which support that claim, uh, both from studies by uh, Keenath et al., the study here. So the first finding is that place cells too display rotational ambiguity. So basically what Keenath et al. did is that they performed a classic full-on reorientation experiment uh, using all the usual procedures while recording from place cells in the subject's brain. And they found that basically on nearly half of the trials, the subject's place cell basically fired in its original field, as in this case here. But on the remaining trials, the, the, the same place cell fired in a field that was misaligned by 180 degrees, as in this case here. The second finding is that where place cells fire is highly predictive of corner choice. So suppose that the, we have the same place cell that fires in its original field here. Uh, it turns out that when this happens, it's in nearly all cases, the animal will go look for the goal in the correct corner. So we'll make the correct corner choice here. But now suppose that the same place cell fired in a field that was misaligned by 180 degrees, as in this case. In that context, what Keenath et al. found is that in nearly all cases, subjects went to look for the goal in the rotational error corner, which is here. So these two findings together, I think, strongly suggest that the origin of rotational errors is in the interactions between the place cell system and its own input systems. All right, let me try to summarize what we've seen. So I've just argued that the origin of rotational errors in reorientation experiments is in the interactions between the place cell system and its own input systems. So I've argued for this on the basis of the keen et al. experiment. Geometric module models can be made compatible with this claim. I've argued for this uh, in step two of the presentation where I propose my own new model that is compatible with this claim. As currently formulated, adaptive combination and associative models cannot. Uh, so that's, that's probably the, the, the weakest part of the argument. I haven't gotten into this in, in much details, but I've tried to suggest that because they focus on decision-making systems, uh, they can be made compatible with this claim. So ergo, we should favor geometric module models over adaptive combination and associative models. So that's it. Thanks for watching. Hi, everyone. My name is Sang Ali, and I'm a faculty member at the Department of Bio and Brain Engineering at KAIST, Korea Advanced Institute of Science and Technology. I'll be continuing the session today by discussing the nature of the input representations to navigation and spatial memory using environmental geometry.
the logic that I will be following is that perceptual information is useful only insofar as it guides behavior. And it wouldn't be surprising at all. In fact, we would expect uh, vision to play a major role in our recognition of the environmental structure. But in order to get some uh, real traction on our understanding of cognition, um, it's crucial that we look more specifically at the nature of the representations and the computations that can explain um, at the neurocognitive level how and why we think and behave uh, the way we do when we navigate. Um, the scientific study of spatial cognition, as most of you know, uh, began many years ago in the 1940s by Tolman, who showed using various experiments, uh, one of which is shown here, that when rats are trained to uh, follow a specific route to get to a reward, um, and then are presented with a transformed maze or, or a different position, a starting position, um, instead of trying to reproduce the egocentric path, for instance here, uh, by going left in this direction, uh, rats instead uh, navigated towards the goal location with, with respect to some external environmental cue, uh, meaning that behavior cannot be explained uh, fully by egocentric stimulus response, uh, but suggesting that uh, we possess a cognitive representation of the spatial environment external uh, to our own bodies. And starting from the 1970s, researchers have made tremendous uh, effort and progress in describing the neural basis of the cognitive map, uh, some of which was discussed in Alexander's talk. Um, this culminated in the awarding of um, the 2014 Nobel Prize uh, to John O'Keefe and the Mosers for discovering the brain's spatial positioning system in the hippocampus. Um, however, the representational pathway through which uh, environmental information is inputted into the hippocampal spatial map to ultimately influence navigation behavior is still unclear. Um, in the 1980s, a very interesting phenomenon was reported showing that rats heavily uh, rely on the environmental boundary layout. So um, as you guys by now know, when rats were shown a target, for instance, here marked with a yellow star um, in one corner, for instance, of this, in, uh, of this room, and then disoriented and placed back into the room, they subsequently based their searches solely on the geometric shape of the room, resulting in a preference for the correct corner, but um, about half of the time, the rotationally symmetrical corner. This meant that they often ignored other cues that they could have used to break their room's geometric symmetry um, and discriminate the correct, correct corner uh, from its geometric twin. I included this slide just to show those of you who are unfamiliar um, with how place cells are recorded from the hippocampus of freely behaving animals, but it's quite self-explanatory. So I will move on to uh, the finding that when animals, in this case mice, perform a disoriented search task like the ones that I uh, showed you above, um, the place cells correspond with the animal's behavior um, at the level of single trials meaning that when an animal goes to the correct corner, uh, the place cells are oriented in a particular direction, but when the animal makes a rotational error, the place map is also all um, as an ensemble oriented um, 180 degrees um, uh, rotated. So it has been known for decades that place cells are actually sensitive to the boundaries of the testing arena, responding more readily to changes um, in the environmental shape uh, rather than other featural cues, um, such as uh, uh, color, brightness, or texture. An influential theory of spatial mapping called the boundary vector cell model uh, posited that place cells using uh, representation of the boundaries around the animals in various directions and distances um, could collectively provide a map for the place cells to encode location. Um, interestingly, just a few years after the model was proposed, um, several papers reported that uh, there is a, a type of spatially selective cells that respond uh, specifically to uh, environmental boundaries such as walls. And if there are multiple walls in the environment, um, the cells would respond um, to all of them, um, uh, indicating that these are some sort of boundary detector type uh, cells. 
and they were found in the entorhinal cortex and subiculum of the hippocampal formation. So many studies by human navigation researchers followed um, in the footsteps of the animal work, um, and uh, a lot of work was done uh, by the speakers at this session um, who have chipped away bit by bit at um, the question of whether humans also have similar biases in our spatial memory and navigation. And it seems that children from the time they're able to walk uh, up to the age of about five or six make these frequent errors based on the geometry of the room, um, again, often failing to take into consideration other types of potentially useful cues um, shown in this picture um, as a red, brightly colored red wall, for instance. Uh, as previously mentioned, some theories of spatial navigation claim that the heavy influence of walls compared to other kinds of cues is simply explainable by a visual image matching mechanism, uh, such as the one shown here in this figure. So according to this theory, this corner of the rectangular room here could look like this in sort of a panoramic image view. Um, and this one here, uh, next to the blue wall, could look like this. And even though the wall colors are different, the overall image view is identical uh, between these two uh, locations. And therefore, because the walls themselves are so much more salient that, than the difference in the color here, uh, then uh, children and all other kinds of animals would make this sort of uh, symmetrical uh, error. To test this hypothesis uh, that boundary-based navigation is attributable um, and explainable uh, by visual image matching and visual salience of large wall-like structures, um, we gradually, uh, over a course of um, the course of several experiments, uh, reduce the height of the walls um, even down to very subtle um, two, to two centimeter high borders um, in, a, in the middle of a circular space, for instance, or um, these kind of curved speed bump like hills um, that broke out of the rectangular form altogether. And then we compare them against uh, very visually salient non-boundary conditions, such as an array of columns with a string tied around it or a rectangular um, visually salient two-dimensional form. And what we found was that none of the um, non-boundary conditions worked for children um, in these cases, um, uh, ages about three, or three to five. And rather, um, 3D structures, whether they're rectangular or not rectangular, uh, subtle or visually salient, seem to be what mattered to the children. So now I was uh, just um, going to show you a few examples of how, how the same kinds of patterns have been found in other animals, extending beyond even mammals. Uh, for the sake of time, I'll just quickly uh, just tell you that uh, newborn chicks just a couple of days old uh, perform very similarly to um, rats and children. Um, and also uh, um, various species of fish have been shown to follow the same patterns as well. And it's important to point out that these studies did not uh, use a reinforcement paradigm. Um, most of them were conducted with an, an animal who was um, placed in a transparent uh, cylinder in the, in the middle of the space, shown a target, a visible target, covered up, and then released to look for a target um, on its own. In this experiment, we tested miniature versions of the environments that I had shown you with children. Um, and found that just as uh, children did, chicks also relied heavily on 3D terrain structure, even the subtle ones that you can see here, um, rather than uh, being able to use um, two-dimensional forms or uh, an array of columns, no matter how visually salient they were. And um, similarly, in fish, uh, we found that uh, zebrafish, in this case, uh, search geometrically only with, with respect to the opaque walls uh, in a rectangular form and not by objects or two-dimensional, uh, visually salient two-dimensional uh, kind of a mat uh, on, on the floor of the tank. So then how much of a role does vision play in these experiments? Um, as I said, during the baiting phase of these experiments, they, the subjects were confined to the center of the arena and therefore uh, they must have represented the goal location visually. Um, and perhaps for that reason, uh, the fish here 
in this condition, in the transparent walls condition, search randomly across the four corners uh, because the walls themselves were transparent. Interestingly, we found the similar result in children, um, in younger children, children younger than the age of about five or six, um, in which we found that they used opaque boundaries from very early on, but had trouble using transparent boundaries, um, even when they knew that the transparent boundaries are impassable. And so it seems that visual perception of boundaries is important uh, to children uh, and their spatial mapping, but it turns out not only um, just children, because um, in this particular study, we found that um, uh, visual walls in virtual reality, um, this is immersive virtual reality, were used in an identical way, uh, showing the same exact pattern of searches and distance errors. Uh, whether they were true boundaries to um, motion, like they corresponded to um, tactile kind of plywood, um, or whether they could be passed through or walked over, um, <clears throat> meaning that the visual array of these um, wall-like stimuli in this VR environment uh, was what was determining the behavior of the subjects in the study. However, um, this pattern was clearly distinguishable um, uh, from a set of cone-like objects that you can see in this condition here. Okay, so then what happens when we, when we pit visual image against, uh, image matching against a representation of 3D boundary surface? So Jane and Ellen Huntlocker and Stella Lorenko had reported um, these fascinating results uh, showing that toddlers search randomly in a square room with alternating plane and patterned walls, but successfully when they are um, in a square room with smaller and larger patterns on opposite walls. So clearly these results go uh, against the predictions of visual image matching. But we went further to show that these patterns may actually be inducing a visual illusion of three-dimensional uh, uh, boundary layouts, uh, such that the shape of the room is manipulated by these patterns to look a little more or less uh, rectangular. So what we did was we found a aspect, uh, rectangular aspect ratio that was slightly rectangular, perhaps kind of a little bit ambiguous. And then we placed uh, regular dot patterns that, um, uh, that were consistent or inconsistent with that slight rectangular shape. And what we found was that only when they were consistent um, with the, the uh, purported um, illusory uh, rectangular shape, children were um, actually um, uh, successful in using those patterns uh, um, to give that geometrically uh, correct uh, pattern of searches. So this means that uh, the dot patterns must have caused a perception, a visual perception of rectangular boundary geometry. And this seems to be true even in mice who show much faster spatial learning uh, by rectangular boundaries and what could potentially be uh, interpreted uh, from the, uh, the developmental study I showed you previously um, as an induced visual illusion of rectangular layout. Clearly, visual representation of 3D surface layout seems to be playing a role in estimating boundary distances and um, consequently the structure of the uh, cognitive map. But what might be some neural inputs to these uh, boundary-based uh, navigation behaviors? So the most obvious places to look are in the scene-selective regions of the high-level visual cortex, like the parahippocampal place area and OPA. Um, it turns out there um, are not only more behavioral uh, confusion and errors, um, but also similarity in neural activity patterns in the PPA and OPA for scenes with similar boundary structures like these two here, or these two here, despite the differences in the actual um, object content and other features such as colors um, and textures. In fact, these visual representations seem to play a causal role in boundary-based uh, navigation. So if you apply TMS um, to the OPA, it causes impairments only in navigation and spatial memory with respect to the 3D boundaries, uh, such as this wall here, and it's not very easily um, visible, um, and not a 2D uh, mat-like um, uh, 
surface marking on the, on the ground. There are patient populations with visuospatial deficits, such as um, Williams syndrome patients, and they, uh, all, they show both decreased behavioral performance, which you can see here, um, as well as PPA activation, which you can see here, um, in response to particularly the curb uh, curb like 3D surface layout. So the subtle um, uh, visual uh, three dimensional boundary layout representation. So finally, what about boundary representation in the human hippocampus? Does navigation only uh, using visual cues and no actual movement in space, um, for instance, in a computer based uh, um, neuroimaging task, activate the hippocampus as well and not only? Um, in the high-level uh, perceptual areas of the brain. So fMRI studies have shown that imagining oneself moving through a this sort of schematic scene um, uh, with horizontal boundaries like these, rather than vertical boundaries, the vertical objects, columns, um, activates the hippocampus to a larger degree. Um, in addition, uh, learning locations in this environment here with respect to a this wall-like uh, boundary here uh, activates the hippocampus specifically uh, but uh, learning locations with respect to a landmark like this cone instead um, is correlated with um, activation not of the hippocampus but of the dorsal uh, striatum. So over the last decade, researchers have begun to record spatial signals directly from the human brain. Um, and um, of course, this is all done with computer-based navigation or computer-based tasks on the laptop um, uh, in these patients. And so in order to interface as much as possible with the detailed neurophysiological signals um, in the rodent navigation research, we looked for direct recordings of visual uh, boundary representation in the human brain in this study. Um, so we compared signals from five different subregions of the hippocampal formation, CA1, dentate gyrus, subiculum, and trorhinal cortex, and uh, perirhinal cortex. And if you remember, the subiculum and entorhinal cortex were where the boundary cells were found um, in the uh, analogous areas in the rodent brain. And first we saw that behaviorally, the locations that were closer to the boundary uh, were more accurate in general. But more importantly, um, what we found was that in the uh, theta frequency, uh, the theta band, uh, we saw neural responses specific, uh, specifically to um, the boundaries. Um, and this was found uh, to be significant only in the subiculum. Um, and as I said, because this human subiculum is analogous to the rodent subiculum, where the largest population of boundary cells have been found, and because the activity of those cells in the rodent brain are theta modulated, we think that we are getting closer to finding that uh, boundary specific uh, neural representation in the human hippocampus, and that these are activated by visual experience of boundaries. So to summarize, a wide range of vertebrates rely on boundaries to map spatial locations, and these boundary representations seem to have similar characteristics across uh, many species. Boundaries can be defined as 3D, visually extended surface layouts, and are dissociable from other featural cues. Visual cortical areas seem to play an important role in providing input um, on environmental boundaries to the hippocampal navigation system, and further hippocampal research um, I believe will provide a window into not only the role of visual uh, information on boundary-based navigation, but in general, the flow of information from perception to um, uh, higher level co cognition, such as uh, hippocampal mapping in memory. Uh, thank you very much. So this is our lab photo for this year. Uh, I would like to thank my lab, uh, my collaborators, and my funding sources. Thanks. Hi, I'm Anna Schusterman from Wesleyan University, and I'm going to be talking about the development of landmark use in reorientation. Uh, thanks to the conference organizers and to Nora for organizing this symposium. Uh, 
So um, I want to highlight that what's cool about the reorientation paradigm is how it allows us to probe uh, the un underlying representations that we might have for um, thinking about space, both in humans and in other species. And we've mostly focused on uh, geometric representations, but I want to focus on landmarks because regardless of um, what you think the origin story is of our geometric use. I think everybody would agree that human children are sensitive to geometric information from very early on for purposes of reorientation, and we see a similar pattern across species as well. And regardless of what you think the origin story of landmark use is, um, it's clear that relative to the use of geometry, it's definitely more vulnerable, it uh, shows a much more protracted developmental profile, and as a result, to me, it's really interesting. Like, why is it so easy and intuitive for human adults to reorient by landmarks, but not so for um, human children and, and potentially for other species? So what is that development about? What is the timeline? What's the process? What pieces of those visual landmarks do children attend to, and what's the nature of the developmental change. So I'm going to use this talk to lay out what I think are some hints. Um, the hypothesis that I was attached to at the time I wrote this abstract that I've been attached to for a long time as a result of the findings that I'm going to show you today, I think I'm, I'm starting to abandon, and I will show you what I'm thinking. Yeah. So. The reorientation task allows us to probe these different underlying representations, but I just want to point out that there's major limits to what we can learn in a rectangular room. Sure, we can learn things about geometry, but it's hard to understand why, what it is that children notice about the relative wall lengths. Um, but more importantly, for landmarks, and children can always use geometry, our conclusions about landmark use are muddled at best. And I want to walk through this argument quickly. So say you have a traditional a rectangular room for a reorientation task with children. You hide the object in one corner. Children will search uh, preferentially at these two different corners um, that are rotationally equivalent to each other. And you can disambiguate them by adding a landmark wall. And if children succeed in going to that correct location, there's actually two possibilities to explain their success. One is that they might have integrated the um, representation of the location um, to the left of the red wall um, with their sense of geometry, um, with the location of the landmark. Um, alternatively, um, and, and so if that's the case, actually, I just want to point out in possibility one, then you don't even need the geometry of the room at all. You should be able to think left of the red wall, even if you're in a square room. So it doesn't even need to be really an integrated uh, representation. You just need to have a spatial relationship. Um, another possibility is that you still continue to use your geometry and um, constrain your search to the two geometrically appropriate corners. And then you can add a piece on top of that and just say, oh, it's at red um, or away from Right, if that's correct. And you don't really need to um, think anything particularly complex or spatial relational. You just need to do those two things at the same time, use geometry and use at. Um, and maybe what's hard for children is to do both of those things at once in the same um, trial. But importantly, it's impossible to distinguish, to distinguish these um, options in a rectangular room. So if we use a square room, we can um, look at landmark representations, we can think about more complex spatial relations than add and away from, um, we can manipulate different properties of the landmark and see if um, maybe we can make a geometry like landmark or bump performance up or down. And in our studies, we use a big room, 10 foot by 10 foot, to track the development of landmark use in the absence of geometric supports. We can get lots of different information from this. We can see if children use the landmark directly. So if we hide it at one of the two corners at red, do they go to red? We can see if they can use it indirectly by going correctly to the left or right sides of the wall. We can see if they um, use it in an at or away from indirect uh, function. So you can use the landmark as a thing to go away from, and that's sort of an indirect use of the landmark on the other axis. So do you go to the white wall when it's at the white wall? 
Um, and the most interesting uh, measurement that I'm going to focus on today is can you really reorient by the landmark? So it's only when the hiding location is at one of the two all-white corners that children really have lost visual contact with the landmark, and that's really when you can get a sense of are they using the landmark to set up kind of a global sense of the space and to orient themselves in that room, or are they just sort of careening towards a corner that um, has, you know, that's the intersection of two white walls. So we argue that um, the only real measurement that shows you real reorientation is whether you go correctly to the left or right sides of the white wall. And the way we measure it is we take only the trials where we hit it at white and the child went to white, so however many trials there are, and out of those you have a 50-50 chance of going correctly to the left or right sides. So that's what we focus on. Um, I want to highlight that I'm not the first one to use square rooms um, to try to study reorientation. Wong, Hermer, and Spelke um, look to see if you take out geometric cues, which maybe just like overshadow everything. Um, do two-year-olds use red walls in a large square room? And the answer is no. Um, Hutton, Lothgar, and Lorenko made a square room with these. Um, they were looking at relative cues, so relative dot size, and investigating that. Um, one possibility in this, however, is that like those relative dot sizes may create illusory depth and might make children feel like they're in a rectangle, even if they're not in a rectangle. And Nardini et al. set up a large square room um, very similar to ours, but with one major difference, which is that they had two marked walls um, that children could rely on. And we just have one, so we can really get that measurement of our children um, using the landmark wall as a cue for reorientation. And then even when they're facing away from it, can they, um, can they use that? So... Uh, just to lay out what our research questions are, we um, want to understand how visual landmarks and features come to be integrated into reorientation behavior in humans. Um, and I'll just articulate two hypotheses. One is the landmark integration hypothesis, um, which suggests that wherever these geometry uh, or sensitive representations come from that are early arising that support reorientation, landmark representations are somehow integrated into those. And the other hypothesis is a spatial symbol hypothesis that um, landmarks are used in a separate cognitive process from the reorientation um, process. They're used essentially as spatial symbols. So just like you could say X is to the left of Y, anything can serve in the role of Y. And maybe there's an abstract cognitive process that's a little bit algebraic that starts to get children to think flexibly about like, oh, what could be a landmark? What could be a Y? How would I navigate um, or remember a location in relation to um, that landmark? And potentially, it's a much more abstract and kind of symbolic process. So to address, um, we first started to um, poke at whether there's aspects of visual scenes or features that could support reorientation and when. And what I'm going to show you is just like a lot of playing that we did with different kinds of visual information, um, trying to see, you know, what's <laughs> trying to identify kind of the boundaries of what makes a piece of information geometric and what makes a piece of information um, a visual feature. Because in the end, children are getting the geometry of the room shape from visual input. So um, we had we wanted to try to find that line. Um, ultimately, we ran seven studies uh, with younger and older children. Um, the dividing line was about five years old. So we ran three to five year olds and five to seven year olds. Every participant got eight trials, four trials at the white wall and four trials at the landmark wall counterbalanced. Um, and we had a number of procedural um, uh, checks to make sure children were actually disoriented on each child, motivated to find the sticker, and kind of that they had noticed the landmark wall. I'm happy to answer questions about these if you have them. Just as a baseline condition, when we have a plain red wall, one thing you can see is that even in a large room, um, when it, the room shape is square and there's no informative geometry to sort of bolster reorientation performance, three to five-year-olds are really quite terrible at this. They don't even go to the red wall um, when the sticker is hidden at a red wall reliably above chance. Um, in older children, you start to see an improvement, right? They start to be able to um, not just go to the landmark red wall when it's at red, but even go to the correct white corner when the um, target location is at white. They're not doing great, just over 60%, but they're definitely doing better than the younger kids.
Um, then we decided to see if we could make um, a visual cue that would elicit geometry-like performance. In other words, could we have uh, illusory geometry um, that would um, force, make three-year-olds succeed on a task in this paradigm? And essentially the answer was no. <laughs> um, even with this giant beautiful mural, which has lots of properties of natural scenes and an environmental boundary and depth and all this stuff, it feels like you can walk into it like a Mary Poppins um, video. Young children don't reorient by that um, asymmetric landscape. That naturalistic scene doesn't elicit illusory geometry. So we know that whatever the geometric cue is in other studies and geometry studies, it's not present in this stimulus. Um, older children, however, really uh, use this wall not just to find the location to the left and the right of the mural, but also to find um, correct locations to the left and the right of the wet white wall across the way from the mural. Um, and we're going to be focusing, as I mentioned, on this white indirect score, whether they distinguish between the two white corners correctly. Um, and when we compare the red wall condition to the asymmetric landscape condition for older kids only, um, it's numerically different, but it's not statistically significant, but we have order effects, we have um, fairly low power. And so what I just want to show you is um, a whole bunch of data where we manipulated all these different things that are in the display. So in this asymmetric um, landscape, there's asymmetry, there's a scene, there's depth, there's an environmental boundary, it has natural elements. Um, and so what we did was um, come up with a whole bunch of cues and ran studies um, with older and younger kids, um, but I'm going to focus on the older ones. Um, so here you can see, for example, an asymmetric carousel and a symmetric carousel. So they have many of the properties that the landscape has, but they're not natural and they don't have an environmental boundary. Um, we have these objects that are displayed that look like you can reach in and touch them, but there's no sense of depth. Um, in terms of a scene. There's just depth in terms of the object. We stripped everything except for asymmetry away and made this asymmetric gradient. And of course, we have baseline data from the red wall. When we put everything together, um, a pattern emerges, which is that the asymmetric um, scenes the ones that you feel like you can walk into really elicit the best performance. Asymmetry on its own in the form of a gradient or a display of objects doesn't elicit um, enhanced performance relative to the red wall. And um, when we put everything into a big omnibus ANOVA, um, we get a symmetry by scene interaction, suggesting that older children can use um, these kinds of landmarks to reorient. and. Uh, in the context of asymmetry and a scene, we get significantly uh, better performance. So what does this tell us? Well, the weird thing is, in reality, every one of these images is actually just a landmark. So if older children only use the images as simple landmarks, we shouldn't expect the specific visual information in the images to influence how they do. But it does influence how they do. So how do we think about this? Um, one idea is that older children are integrating landmark representations um, into uh, whatever supporting reorientation, so more integrated module model. And another possibility is that landmark use is still a separate cognitive process, but there's some landmarks that are better at eliciting that process than others. So that would be still consistent with the spatial symbol hypothesis. I'm starting to lean towards the first one that what we're seeing is um, the murals and the visual features that are easier to integrate, they're more geometry-like, um, that they're getting integrated into reorientation behavior. And here's why. Here's one piece of evidence. Um, prior to COVID, we embarked on a pre-registered replication of the asymmetric versus symmetric landscape experiment. We only got through the asymmetric condition before we closed the lab. Um, but interestingly, halfway through, um, after one full counterbalancing condition and we waited to be kind of between counterbalancing sets, um, the mural had gotten quite wrinkled, just like heat and humidity and children bumping into it. And uh, it's really three murals that are kind of uh, glued together at the seams. And we decided to smooth it. And just as a check, we checked to see um, is the wrinkled versus the smooth um, mural, does it have any impact? If children um, succeed with the asymmetric mural 
um, because it was a salient, complex, colorful spatial symbol, it enters well into whatever spatial symbolic computation you need, then you shouldn't see any difference between the wrinkled and smooth mural. But if, on the other hand, uh, the asymmetric mural uh, six, um, helped children with reorientation because it elicited the sense of place and depth and environmental geometry, then the smooth mural should do that better and you should see an advantage for the smooth mural over the wrinkled mural. And indeed, that was what we found. The smooth mural, which looked when, you, um, when you're in the room, much less like an object and much more like a space you could enter, um, elicited better reorientation performance in terms of finding the correct location at the white wall than the uh, mural with the wrinkle, which looked like a very large picture with a little wrinkle in it. The second piece of evidence comes from um, my master's student, uh, Kendall Carr, who wanted to look for a task general ability to use landmarks and to see if whatever it is that um, is emerging in landmark use and reorientation could be found in other tasks. And so she made a computer version of the land of a reorientation task. There's no real reorientation happening here. You get two training trials where you, you watch this little green bobblehead go to one location, it goes to the same location both times, but from different perspectives, and then children see a third perspective and they have to say, where does the green bobblehead want to go? Um, and we found absolutely no correlation between any aspect of landmark use in the video task and the real room. So depending on which measurement we used between 0 0.034 and 0 0.18, and none of it was significant. So this suggests that there's not some kind of general, more abstract um, ability emerging over um, early childhood to start to be able to use landmarks. Because if it did, you would expect to see it emerging in multiple task contexts. So in conclusion, um, I'm in favor of the integration hypothesis. The spatial symbol hypothesis doesn't seem to be explaining the data very well. And so the proposal is that over development, children begin to integrate landmarks into their geometric schema of the room for purposes of reorientation. Um, some landmarks are more readily incorporated into the schema, the ones potentially that have um, more in common with real uh, geometric information, the ones that elicit um, some of the same properties that natural scenes might have, like asymmetry and depth. Um, one we can characterize them, the helpful landmarks in some ways, like more realistic, more place-like, and I'm not sure what the right descriptors are um, that also explain why three-year-olds can't use them at all for purposes of reorientation. One possibility is that the more helpful landmarks support building a strong room-based frame of reference um, and that that in turn supports reorientation. So I want to thank my research assistants, the families, our funders, and thanks to you for listening.